Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen to another episode of Simon Says. This is my intro video where I go over some of the more theoretical aspects of limited and drafting in particular. Of course we are talking about Theros once again and I just have some thoughts to share with you. Theros theories if you want. Alright, this is my slideshow. Um, those of you who have been following my videos for a while already know the looks of it. I'm no PowerPoint master, but I hope that this helps to visualize some of the concepts I'm talking about and that you'll see reflected in my drafting and probably also the play, although it's a little less clear there because there are so many options and things that can happen. I want to talk about Theros in a minute, but just so we're all on the same page, there are some rules to a limited deck composition that are basically um, agreed upon and experience has shown us that this is how a limited works in general. So we have a 40 card deck and we are going to have about 17 lands in, in these decks. Sometimes you can get away with uh, 16, sometimes you will have 18. Sometimes you have 17 lands and two mana sources or one and a half mana sources. So 17 is, is the baseline. We also want quite a lot of creatures and you can fit up to 17 creatures into a deck very easily. If you are a control deck, sometimes there are extreme cases where you have 12, 13, 14 creatures, but then you have need to have a very good curve and removal to compensate the lack of creatures because you won't have defend you won't have that many creatures defending you in the especially in the early game. Okay, now with this very simple math we arrive at 34 and that leaves only up to six other card types uh, in our in our limited decks. And this is divided in, between removal, bounce spells, combat tricks and auras. And you can count the bounce spells. Sometimes they act as removal, sometimes they act as combat tricks, sometimes they act as disenchant effect, sometimes only as tempo play. So bounce spells are a little bit um, peculiar here. But if we play 17 creatures, we will only have six total. So for example, we could play four removal spell and two combat tricks and that's it. But if we play less creatures, then we will have more space for these kind of effects. The problem is, well, first of all, if you add in more removal, but play less creatures, then you are a control deck and everything is fine. But if you lower your creature count, so let's say you go from 17 down to 13, that gives you 10 potential non-creature spells. So you could play 4 removal spells, a bound spell, and then 5 combat tricks and auras combined. However, the problem is, if you have only 13 creatures, playing 5 or more creature-dependent cards is creating a lot of anti-synergy or, well, missing coherence in your deck, uh, which is pretty easy to think about. If you play a lot of combat, tri combat tricks and auras, you want to be proactive, you probably want to be aggressive to make the best use out of these tricks and punish opponents who stumble on the defensive. However, if you're only playing 13 creatures, which is what's left after you've added these 10 cards, then the amount of games where you're actually going to be able to curve out and be the aggressor is going to be a lot less than if you had 17 creatures and were almost guaranteed to curve out. So there's a rule of thumb that I've learned from Andre Müller and I don't always adhere to that and I, I think that you always have to look at your deck in particular but it's it's a nice rule to keep in mind and that is that the number of creatures should be about 12 plus the number of tri combat tricks and auras that you're going to play. So if you are playing 17 creatures, then you then you could play a total of five creature-dependent cards. But as we see here, that only leaves space for a single removal spell because then you're, you've, you've um, uh, put 40 cards in your deck already. So this shows you that there is a, a pretty hard limit on how many creature-dependent spells you can actually put into your decks. Now, in Theros, we have, as I've talked about before, Heroic, Bestow, Monsters, and Devotion as the main mechanics. And Heroic and Bestow leads to there being a lot of um, combat tricks. The utility of combat tricks is just so much better, and Bestow means that you are, you'll be putting auras on your um, already existing creatures and 
that means that you're going to be ahead of the curve when it comes to attacking and that makes attacking easy but blocking difficult and monstrous is not necessarily an aggressive mechanic but also means that your creatures are going to grow when it's your turn uh, allowing your creature to attack making it more difficult to block for your opponent monsters is monstrous creatures are great at creating board presence so are heroic creatures and of course devotion is a mechanic that is uh, only as good as your board presence so it scales with the board presence that you have board presence is Board presence and, and attacking are the key things in Theros Limited. And one thing that makes it even more difficult to be defensive, so be controlling, be, um, be a control deck, be blocking a lot, is that every archetype has access to mana sinks. So if your plan is to let your aggressive opponents flood out with a regular control deck and have a slightly higher curve and then take over the late game, then all these bestow creatures, all these monstrous uh, creatures might make it difficult to actually gain inevitability over an aggressive, more aggressive deck. Of course, the devotion, especially Grey Merchant of Asphodel, or the heroic creatures that grow out of bounds also make that difficult. So playing control in Theros is certainly not easy. Uh, if you can be attacking, you definitely want to be attacking. And there is another reason why, why playing control is, is difficult, and that is because of Heroic and Bestow and Monstrous, your regular removal spells are going to be worse than they usually are. You almost have to kill Heroic creatures as soon as you see them, because letting your opponent untap with a Heroic creature in play and the potential combat tricks or protection spells in hand is super dangerous. If your opponent starts bestowing, then your removal spells are only going to trade one for one, but you're behind in tempo. And the monstrous creatures you often can't deal with at all. So playing control, playing removal spells, difficult in Theros. Attacking is easy, playing control is difficult. Now, what does this mean for the Theros deck composition when we are drafting and we are looking at the packs? We have to have our deck in mind because this is... Well, if you pick the, your fifth removal spell or your 20th creature and in the end you won't be able to play them, then, uh, well, things haven't really worked out. So the problem is that we have a very mana-hungry format, but there's a lot of mana sinks, which means that about 18 mana sources is right for most of the decks. We want a high creature count because we are going to put a lot of creature-dependent cards into our decks. Removal is somewhat important. We've already touched upon why it isn't as good as, as it was before. Bounce, in theory, is great because of all the auras and tricks, so if you can respond to that, it's a great play. Combat tricks, however, are crucial because they protect your creatures and they will make sure that you, um, you can trigger heroic or save your heroic creatures or both. It also means that, well, combat tricks are, are the main car card type that allow you to be more aggressive and keep attacking, which is one of the pillars of the format. And auras, in a sense, make everything work, because they will allow you to keep attacking, they trigger heroic, but they also help in the fight of enormous monsters, because the monster with an additional plus two, plus two, or plus three, plus three effect will just be the superior creature. So with that said, you can probably already guess what I'm uh, trying to say here. If we play 18 mana sources, we need a high creature count. We already know that we won't have that much space to fit all these cards in our deck. So depending on what we are trying to do, we won't be able to play removal, bounce, combat tricks and auras. Although auras are a little bit special because bestow creatures will give us auras and a high creature count. So um, just from this alone, we see that if we want to make things work, bestow creatures are definitely the way to go uh, because they act as split cards in that regard. All right, so we are now ready to write down some rules that apply to Theros Limited. And the most important rule is you can't fit everything in. You will have trouble putting everything you want in your decks if you just go by a, well, let's say, traditional deck building approach in Limited. And because um, combat tricks and auras are so important and there is just your regular amount of removal and bounce, you will have a lot of 
these cards available, but you won't have a lot of space in your deck. So this is another reason why you really only want the best removal spells, you only want the best bounds, you only want the best tricks. Even if your deck is a hero heroic deck, in the end you won't be playing 10 tricks, it just doesn't fit. So make sure that you have the tricks that you want and you have the diversity that you want, but don't play a card just because it says target on it. Now, just from going over these rules, we, we've seen that Bestow is really the, one of the best mechanics for Theros Limited. You get a creature, you get an aura, and you get a mana sink, and it rewards attacking, but you can also put, put this on a creature to stay back, and you won't get blown out because you still get uh, the creature um, that you bestowed with. So I can't stress this enough. Bestow is amazing. And then just two more things. When you have heroes, which I call the heroes with heroic, then all your targeting effects become better. But if you have a lot of targeting effects, but not a lot of heroes, well, then your targeting effects aren't really getting better. Um, they, are, they are just the mediocre cards that they are. So um, make sure to prioritize the creatures with heroic rather than picking up tricks really early because the tricks will be a little bit better than in, in your traditional formats but if you can't pick a critical mass of of heroic uh, cards then well they won't really work out all right now going back to the first point that you can't fit everything in and looking at looking at this chart here if you don't have enough space for removal, bounce, karma tricks, and auras, and we can ignore bounce for now because it's really only a blue mechanic. So if you don't have the space for removal, karma tricks, and auras, then just make sure that you can use karma tricks and auras to substitute for your removal. So tricks, tricks and auras can act as removal spells, and that only works, or mostly only works, if you can be the aggressor and can use these as tempo plays. So you want to be attacking with your creatures, you force your opponent to block, and then blow them out with your tracks and auras, potentially even triggering heroic. Um, if your opponent doesn't block, then you just play the next creature and try to keep on the pressure. What you don't want to happen is that you are on the defensive and you have to play your tricks because your creatures are weaker, because then you will be running into your opponent's uh, tricks or, or removal spells. Now, bounce is something which I've thought about a lot. Now there is Voyage's End and Griptide and it doesn't really blow people out all that often because it only stops things for a very short amount of time. You can prevent a creature from going monstrous but if the game has progressed that far then that creature is just going to come down and it's just not as likely that you'll be able to carry the tempo advantage um, to um, to a victory. Now, what Bounce is good at is if you are already ahead on the board um, and your opponent is behind and on, in a defensive position, Bounce is absolutely amazing. Um, you'll, you'll just be able to attack more freely, use your other tricks more effectively, and probably, probably win some games that other cards wouldn't have won. But um, this is, in a sense... An effect that acts as a as a win more card. If you have your creature count and you have your tricks to punch through and to stay aggressive, then having bounce spells or in addition to that is just icing on the cake. But the core cards that li uh, li led you there uh, were the different card were other cards, uh, lands, creatures, and tricks. So adding in the bounce into the equation is going to lead to some draws where the bounce isn't what you need to actually stay aggressive, but it's just going to sit there and you are um, left thinking if, if you would rather have something else. That doesn't mean that bounce is bad, but remember that you don't have enough space to play every every single good card in Theros. So if you are drafting a blue-white heroic deck that's aggressive, would you really do you really want to have these Voyages Ends and the and the grip tides? Or do you just want to have more plus two plus two scry run effects? Because they will allow you to attack and trigger heroic and scry, which isn't isn't completely irrelevant. So just something to think about. And I'll conclude this with a look at the
comments and theros. Now, this is just a very um, subjective list, um, and I'm going to add my subjective views on this. So, when we look at white, we, we get to see Wingsteed Rider, and that's by far the best card, because it's a, it's a common heroic creature that's already amazing um, as a 2-2 flyer for 3, and then it's very easy to grow it, and yeah, it's, it's very tough to deal with. On the other hand, we see that there is Divine Verdict, God's Willing, Hopeful Eidolon, and Observant Elseed. And if you ask me, God's Willing is nice, but there is too much competition for it. So I'm, I'm not picking this one early. And the same goes for Divine Verdict. It's very easy to play around, and having a clunky removal spell isn't what you want. If you want to be attacking, then you don't want to have Divine Verdict in your hand, but you want to have a white um, combat trick in your hand. So this one is out as well. And then that leaves Hopeful Eidolon and Observant Outseed, which I'm big fans of, fan of, a big fan of, because they are the bestow creatures that make the heroic decks work. So my pick order for this would be Wingsteed Rider first, Observant Outseed second, and then Hopeful Eidolon over both the Divine Verdict and God's Willing, and I believe most of the other white commons. Yeah, I, I didn't put any other here. So in early on, I would pick Hopeful Eidolon over divine verdict and god's willing now for the blue commons i only put four different commons here i suppose you could put um prescient chimera uh fifth but i don't i don't really like it that much i think it's it's not really um well suited for the format and here we see grip tide and voyages and next to nimbus nyad and wave crash triton now nimbus nyad is my pick for for best blue common because it's a bestow creature and it's good on 3 and 5, and it solves all the problems that blue has. It's also good in, in basically any deck, so I, I really, really like it. It's, in a, in a sense, it's comparable to Leaf Crown Void, but it's just so much better because it's it's better on the on the offense. Now, if you ask me, Grip Tide and Voyage's End are a lot worse than people think, and I actually don't like Grip Tide all that much, uh, for the reasons that I discussed before it can be an absolute blowout but it's usually only a blowout if you are ahead and it going it's going to keep you winning but it, it's very difficult to play a grip tight and start winning from from a losing position so that one is out and then that leaves voyages end and wave crash triton might surprise some people here wave crash triton is it doesn't, it doesn't look amazing. It only has one power, so it's not the most aggressive creature. It does have four toughness, which is really good. Uh, and the trigger is surprisingly relevant and really difficult to play against because tapping down a creature for a full turn is very comparable to bouncing it. Now, Voyage's End is still an amazing card because it it's, fits very well into the whole format. But Wave Crash Triton is my pick for most underrated common at the moment and I actually like to pick Wave Crash Triton really really high and I would pick this over Voyages End and the reason for that I'm, I'm actually going to cross this out um, you can uh, write write me a comment on why you think uh, this is wrong but my, my reasoning here is that in the end I know that I won't have a lot of space for non-removal non-tricks non-creatures and this is what bounce is so if i start first picking voyages end then what's my goal do i want to end up with a deck with two voyages end and a grip tide no i don't i i'm happy if i pick up one of them and put them in my deck i'm i can usually make get get that one spot for these cards but i don't want to have i want i don't want to have multiple of them on the other hand, Wave Crash Triton, if I pick up a second one, then I, I'm actually heading towards a nice heroic deck, or I might pair it with white or green and just build a heroic deck naturally, and then the deck just becomes a lot more coherent. I don't want to play bounce spells on my own uh, heroic creatures, I want to put meaningful auras or um, combat tricks on them. So Wave Crash Triton is my, my sleeper pick among the blue commons, and I think the, the whole theory that we devised kind of backs that up. Okay, in black we have Lash of the Whip, and that's pretty much out already. It only gives minus four, minus four. It's really clunky, and it's difficult to apply in this format. I like Grey Merchant of Asphodel. 
And I like that Baleful Eidolon and Disciple of Phoenix give you a nice uh, way to play a control game. Uh, Baleful Eidolon blocking anything on the ground and being nice on 5 mana, although not spectacular. Disciple of Phoenix just as a nice way to get some card advantage and block the, um, the two power aggressive creatures. Now, black doesn't really have the most of the problems that the other colors have, because in black you aren't looking to be too aggressive and you don't have the heroic sub strategy so you aren't picking up all these creature dependent cards so in black it's a lot more easy to just draft a regular deck which is probably why i end, end up in black so often uh, because this is what i'm i'm most familiar with i still think that gray merchant of asphoda is a fine first pick but it's well the, the power level the overall power level of the of the black commons isn't absolutely amazing and you can't always guarantee that you're going to be heavy black so um, take this with a grain of salt now red has a real problem so just like just as black doesn't really have the the problem um, that we've talked about red is just um, the the color that has the biggest problem with prioritizing the right cards lightning strike is by far the best card in the from the red commons just looking at the power level but it is it doesn't enable heroic it only helps you to punch through if your opponent plays wimpy creatures basically if you if you can burn it doesn't happen all that often that you can burn somebody out because board presence is more important than than getting through the last points of damage and so on and so on so lightning strike is the best red common if you look at this in a vacuum, but Lightning Strike is also the most problematic when it comes to deck composition. So, uh, and Rage of Perforos is just a weaker version of Lightning Strike. I'm just going to cross that out because it has the same problems as Lash of the Whip in a sense. So, what what you want is Spearpoint Aureate because it's the red bestow creature, but it has the problem that it costs six to bestow. You want Ill-Tempered Cyclops. Um, because it's your mana sink, it's your 6-6 aggressive creature, but you can't really pick Ill-Tempered Cyclops above, um, ra over, over Lightning Strike or even Spearpoint Aurea. That would be ra rather weird. And just look at Ill-Tempered Cyclops compared to a card like Nessian Asp. If Ill-Tempered Cyclops is the common monstrous creature that Red gets, then you, you can see that Red is getting the, the shaft here. There is an argument to be made that Titan Strength is one of the key cards in Red because it's it's the one mana trick that keeps you attacking and is is an, a really nice blowout. But on the other hand, are you really going to first pick Titan Strength and then end up with three Titan Strength in your deck? I know that there is strategies that do that, but if things don't uh, go well, if things don't come together, then you are just going to be sitting there with a pile of one mana cards that don't really accomplish anything. And this is basically it's Titan Strength. You can also count Dragon Mantle and then you will have... Um, not only uh, the creatures here, but also a Crone Crusader and, and uh, the Two-Headed Cerberus. All these cards that, if you put them in one deck, they look good, but if you put them in another deck, they aren't all that exciting. So I think this exemplifies why Red has a problem in Theros Limited and why it's very, very difficult to build successful Red decks that aren't just focused on beating down as quickly as possible and, and being super aggressive. Um, uh, an archetype I think that Caleb Derwald has, has done some videos on. You can check these out. I, I think it's a great strategy, but I, I think it's fringe and you have to be really careful if you want to draft quote-unquote normal decks with red in them by first picking Lightning Strike and following it up with something else. Last but not least, there is green and in a lot of lists, you can see that Leaf Crown Diet, Nassian Asp, and Voyaging Seder are considered the, the best green commons. And I agree that Nassian Asp has to be number one. It's, it's an amazing common creature. It solves the problem of being attacked in the air. It is large enough that people, even with a combat trick, can't always attack into it. And on seven mana, it, it, it becomes absolutely huge and dominates the board. So Nassian Asp is, is my favorite card here. And I, w I wasn't sure about the question of Leaf Cronduite and Voyaging Seder, but I've basically stopped picking Voyaging Seders. Um, if you have it on turn two, it's nice to accelerate into something, but the cards you accelerate into 
aren't all that much better than what your opponent is doing and then if you start blocking with them you run into the tricks so not having a two drop with board impact might be more painful than than actually having the accelerant i'm i'm not picking the satyr anymore but leaf crown dryad has grown in my appreciation a lot so leaf crown dryad is a card i really like and then it comes back to not only the bestow creatures being great but also the fact that there is a common heroic card uh, and that is staunch hearted warrior so staunch hearted warrior is in a in a sense just like wave crash triton is my sleeper pick for blue i think that staunch hearted warrior is my sleeper pick for green i like to be aggressive anyway and it works really well with leaf crown dryad it's also nice in the curve with nasty and asp so i pick staunch hearted warrior over voyaging setter and i i think that the best green decks also have a nice a little heroic theme to them if you if you don't have well only nasty and asps and leaf crown dryads i suppose which which also works but you have to get in the damage somehow and then once you have the staunch Eye warrior you have you have actually quite a nice um array of of tricks and um spells in green to enable heroic all right uh i hope that made a little bit of sense and you could probably see a little bit of this with uh, me drafting now and the next times we open a pack of Theros together. Enjoy the show, thanks for watching, see you next time. Bye bye!